So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yisrael Mirsky. I'm a PhD student at Ben Gurion University. Um, also a project manager at the BGU Cybersecurity Labs. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you today about is uh, bridging air gap networks. Uh, most of the works I'm going to show to you today are, were authored by Mordechai Guri, a colleague of mine, a PhD student in our labs, mentored by Professor Yuval Levich. But since Mordechai Guri was not able to come today, I, as a co-author, will be presenting in his place. So let's begin. What is an air gap network? So the typical approach to a security network looks something like this. You have the internet, or some public domain, and you have a private network. And the private network is separated with some sort of firewall or network intrusion detection system. And as we know, the attacker wants to try and get into that network from remote. And he also wants to perhaps have some malware exfiltrate information out of the network back to the attacker. And we know that there are holes in this uh, approach. So they came up with an idea called the air gap approach. The air gap approach is the idea that we'll put a physical disconnect between our private isolated network and all other public networks. The idea is if there's no connection between our private network and our public network, then the attacker can't put inf send information into the network to his malware, and he can't exfiltrate information from his malware out. So that looks something like this. You have an air gap network, uh, some sort of uh, installation, and you have the public network such as the internet, and the attacker, since he has no physical connection, no Wi-Fi, no ethernet connection, he can't uh, communicate with the network and he can't attack that network. Some examples of air gap networks that exist today are military defense systems, financial systems such as the stock exchange, industrial control systems, critical infrastructure, power plants, refineries, air traffic control, command control centers, computerized medical equipment, and so on. But we know that uh, putting an air gap is not a uh, perfect solution. There's, here's just a small list of malwares that in the last few years have been found to infect these air-gapped computers in one way or another. For example, the Stuxnet uh, virus, which, by, uh, which infected the Iranian nuclear power plants, even though the Iranian nuclear power plants were not connected to the public network. So some sort of infected USB was plugged in at some point, perhaps, and uh, infected the network that way. So how does that happen? What are those steps? So the first step essentially is uh, the initial infection. In the initial infection, a uh, malicious or deceived insider plugs in a USB or some other media into the system, infects the network with the malware. Or another option is that uh, there's some sort of supply chain attack happens where the uh, hardware, perhaps the uh, USB keyboard or some other preferable is uh, infected at the factory when it is made and then brought into the isolated network and plugged in and then infects in the network. After the net isolated network has been infected with the malware, the second step is for the, for the attacker to have the malware perform some sort of activity, whether it be stealing sensitive data, ma manipulating uh, control systems, deleting records, and so on and so forth. So the real question is, and we know that malwares can get into air gap networks. But how can the attacker communicate with his malware once it's in the network? And how can he get information out of the networks because of the air gap? Now, there are a few different kinds of channels we'll talk about today. One kind is inbound channels. Inbound channels are where the attacker wants to send information to his malware, and outbound channels where the attacker wants to pull information out of the network. Some examples why attacker would want to use inbound or outbound channels. So for an inbound channel, he may want to send the malware uh, some command to attack at that moment, giving him the flexibility of when to attack. He may want to lay dormant for a while, right, and then attack at the most opportune moment. He want, may want to send updates to the malware, uh, new modules, fixes, perhaps change the encryption key. And uh, for outbound channels, he may want to exfiltrate information, passwords, uh, documents, key logs, and he may want to get reports on his attack, which is very advantageous for him to know whether his commands have been received by the malware at all, and what is the progress of the uh, lateral movement through the network? So the bulk of what we're going to talk about today are the different methods of exfiltrating information or bridging the air gap, uh, sending information, building these covert channels from the air gap network to the public network. And there are three general uh, channels for doing, if you're doing this. You have thermal channels, you have acoustic channels, sound, optical channels, 
and radio channels. Of these 11, which we're going to talk about today, 10 of them were uh, discovered in our labs. So let's start with thermal channels. The first type of thermal channel we'll talk about is called HVACer. Now, the idea is that modern computers have thermal sensors in them, and quite a few. You have thermal sensors in the CPU, you have thermal sensors on the motherboard, and it's mainly there to be able to regulate the temperature of the computer to protect the computer from not overheating. Now, the idea is that if we can change the temperature in the room, raise the temperature in the room, and lower the temperature in the room, the computer can pick up these changes and interpret that as binary information. So the question is, how can we, an attacker manipulate the temperature in the room? Right? Well, in many cases, insecure networks are overlapping in the same physical space as uh, uh, the public, net, uh, as private and protected networks. And one of those types of, of uh, networks, as an example, is the HVAC system, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. It's typically a system uh, that has its own network, manages the air conditioning, heating of an entire building, and the elevator systems, and so on. Now, these HVAC systems have uh, many times a web portal for the IT people to connect from remote to monitor the system and adjust the temperature accordingly. If you do a quick search in the Shodan uh, I.O. search engine, you'll find, uh, this is actually a search from a year ago, 36,000 uh, Niagara is an example HVAC system web portal uh, that's been exposed to the, inter uh, to the internet. And only 269 of those are actually protected with H HTTPS. So what the idea is, the attacker would hack the HVAC system, get into that system, because it's not considered a secure system, and he'd rather easily infect it. And then he'd be able to manipulate the temperature of the building, perhaps at night when there's fewer people, that, people there, and broadcast messages to uh, his malware. Now this sound, may sound kind of romantic, and kind of like spyware, uh, kind of spy tools and stuff like that, but it's not too far-fetched. As a matter of fact, in 2013, some researchers were able to hack the Google uh, HVAC system in Australia, in the Google office, and they were able to pull out the uh, schematics of the floor plans, change the temperature in the room, and all sorts of different kinds of things like that. So this is what the attack model looks like, as we said. The attacker is somewhere in the internet. He uh, hacks the HVAC system, gains control of it, manipulates the temperature up and down, and sends basically signals 0101 to the malwares that are on those computers. So to send a, ma send a bit, you would raise uh, the temperature in the room. So uh, send a, uh, if it's a, sorry, if it's a one, then you raise the temperature. If it's a zero, it lowers the temperature. And the receiver looks at one of these uh, thermal sensors in the computer. And if the trend of the, of the temperature room is going up, that means it's a one. If the trend is going down, that means it's a zero. And if it's more or less staying the same, then he just repeats the same bit as seen in the last interval. Now, to make sense of all this information coming through and make sure that's reliable, is likely that the attacker will put this uh, bitstream into a typical layer two protocol and communication, so basically called framing. So he has, as you can see at the bottom, he has a, will send a preamble before a message, a one zero, indicating there's a message coming in. So if the malware sees that, he'll begin deciphering. An opcode saying what activity the malware should do, whether it's self-destruct, delete an asset, and so on. A parity bit to help uh, the uh, uh, reliability and the payload if necessary. So this is just a, a higher view of the protocol. So you can expect that the malware at night be, uh, sorry, wait during the day, sleep during the day, and then activate at night when there's fewer people, people around. It'll look for a preamble. If it ever sees a preamble, it'll investigate the frame's uh, integrity. Afterwards, it might collaborate with peers, other malwares in the network, to see if anybody else has received this frame and share this information. And then if everybody agrees that this is a good frame, a good frame it will then act upon the opcode and perform the malicious attack. And finally, of course, if there's no, if a malware doesn't receive any messages within the network, it's likely that's not near any air conditioning system, and then it should self-destruct itself. In other words, delete all traces it was ever there. So in our experimental results in a small office scenario, we got about 40 bits per hour, which is actually quite a lot when all you want to do is send a command saying, start this activity or start that activity. But the question you may think about is, what about internal interference? You know, when a computer is performing different operations, it may heat up, it may cool down, and it may uh, affect the channel that we, we've built here. So we checked with video playing, 
web browsing and word processing, and we found that the thermal sensor on a motherboard is not affected by these uh, typical processes, and uh, it can pick up the temperature uh, fluctuations in the room quite well. To sum up, uh, so the HVACer, what kind of countermeasures can we deploy? So we can disable or at least secure the HVAC web portals. We can monitor the temperature environment for fluctuations that seem suspicious, and we could look for these kind of very specific malware signatures. So let's move over to the next type of uh, method of bridging air gaps through uh, thermal channels, and that's Bit Whisper. So uh, we know computers can receive thermal seg signals, but we also know that computers can generate heat. So using these two ideas together, we can make a bi-directional channel. That means we, if two computers happen to be close to, to each other, one another, we can have one computer heat up when it wants to send a message to the other, and it can listen also on the thermal sensor if another computer is trying to talk to it. But why is that interesting? Well, a few reasons. Uh, sometimes you have leased computing spaces where you have stacks of computers in a, a leased uh, space, and uh, the computers may, one computer may be air-gapped, another computer may not be air-gapped, you may want to uh, send information between one another. Uh, and uh, also, in the case of a virtual machine, you may have several uh, virtual, mach virtual computers running in a virtual machine, and uh, you may want them to communicate with one another by heating up the environment and cooling off the environment. So the attack model looks something like this. Two computers next to one, e one another, and they're communicating to one another by raising the temperature or doing nothing, letting the room kind of cool off. So how do they generate heat? There's two easy ways of doing that. You can put a large load on the CPU or a large load on the GPU, and that uh, emits heat from the computer, and the computer, that heat is then received by the, uh, uh, the computer that's next to it, interpreted by the thermal sensor. Okay, so these are the uh, setups that we examined. Uh, next, one computer's next to each other, on top of each other, back to back, and so on and so forth. We checked two different kinds of line encodings. The first one on the left is what we kind of did with uh, uh, HVACer. Basically, if it heats up, then it's a one. If it cools down, then it's a zero. The second one is a, a more of a novel technique where basically we say, let's split up every 16 seconds into 16 intervals. If we ever see impulse of heat, at let's say the seventh second, that means we sent a binary seven. And then we wait for the next set of 16 seconds, wait for another signal, and that way there's less fluctuations and it's easier uh, to read the signal and have less interference. Okay, some countermeasures for BitWhisper. Uh, physically distancing air-gapped computers from uh, non-air-gapped computers. We can perhaps have just a strong air conditioning in the room to try block out those signals. And we can use uh, malware signatures and uh, environment, environmental sensing. So just a quick uh, demo. Okay, so what you have here is on the left is a uh, computer connected to the internet, supposedly. And on the right, you have a computer which is an air-gapped computer, perhaps a military defense system. And we have, a, of course, connected to this little military defense system, a little uh, toy missile launcher. And the heat in the room, and the, uh, the non-air-gapped computer is heating up, uh, setting binary zeros and ones to move the, the uh, missile launcher and eventually uh, launch the missiles. In the bottom corner, you can see the uh, thermal signals being sent back and forth between the two com uh, neighboring computers. <laughs> okay. So that's it for thermal channels. Let's talk about the next type, which is acoustic channels. <clears throat> so the first type of acoustic channel is uh, ultrasonic, uh, done by uh, uh, Michael Hansbach and Michael uh, Goetz. And the idea here is that you can use speakers to emit sound as your transmitter, and you can use microphones as a receiver. And not only that, if you do that in, with ultrasonic frequencies, the human ear can't pick that up, but the computers can. Thus, you've basically made a covert channel where two computers or even smartphones can communicate with one another if they're in close enough proximity. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but uh, there was a security researcher called Dragos, which 
uh, claimed he found this kind of uh, malware in his BIOS. And no matter what he did, uh, there's still some sort of communication going on between his computer uh, sending packets, even known that uh, he had disconnected his network. So the attack model here is you have some sort of mesh network in the air gap side where compu one computer holding the asset transmits the information to another computer nearby and it kind of goes through a random chain in an ad hoc manner until it reaches a computer that's connected to the internet. And then that computer transmits that information directly to the attacker. And same vice versa. If the attacker wants to send a command to the, to the computer inside the uh, air gap network, the same process can follow. So some countermeasures, you can put out ultrasonic noise emitters to try and block out that frequency. It won't bother humans, but it'll bother the communication. And uh, you can enforce more stricter zoning policies, bringing, making sure that there's no microphones anywhere near uh, uh, restricted zones. The second type of acoustic channel we'll talk about is fan smitter, which is a, a rather recent work that we did in our labs. And the idea is that computers many times have fans, and we can manipulate the fan speeds, whether it be the, the case fan or the CPU fan or power supply fan, in order to change, uh, make uh, s uh, different acoustic signals that can be received by a nearby smartwatch or smartphone. But why is that interesting? I mean, we already saw the acoustic, uh, the uh, ultrasonic met method. So why do we want to? Why would we care about using fans? And the reason is that many times computers don't have a microphone or, or specifically a speaker to be able to emit these signals. But almost every computer has a fan. So the idea is even if you have like a stack of servers, you can manipulate the fan speeds and thus send information to a nearby computer or smartphone that's listening for those uh, fluctuations. So this is what the attack model looks like. You have a computer infected with uh, malware prior. It affects the uh, fan speeds and a nearby microphone picks it up and demodulates that uh, information into binary, sending it to the attacker. With this method, we got about 15 bits uh, per minute at a distance of about eight meters using one of two different kinds of modulation techniques. One is uh, ASK, amplitude shift keying, where it's a very uh, basic uh, communication uh, protocol where if you raise this, the, the power of the signal, that means it's a one. You lower the power of the signal, it's a zero. We found there were two interesting properties here, the fan, the fan speed and the blade pass frequency. Typically, uh, these will affect which frequency uh, you, the uh, channel is emitting and what channel you're emitting on. And uh, typically, we also found that uh, most fans have about seven blades, so the table at the bottom basically show the uh, transmission frequencies, the channel that the, any malware that would be wanting to listen to this kind of channel uh, would have to be listening on, so that's between about 100 hertz to 550 hertz. The second method is uh, frequency shift keying, where in frequency shift keying, instead of changing the strength of the signal, we change the frequency on which we're transmitting. So in other words, we may speed up the fan faster to a frequency of F1 to transmit a one, and we may lower this, uh, the frequency to uh, frequency of F0 to transmit a zero. And if you can see here the uh, spectrogram at the bottom of a recording of audio, you can see very clearly the fluctuations in the frequency as we're sending 101. So how do you do that in a program programmatically uh, speaking? So you can affect the BIOS. You can have the, the malware can try and uh, affect the fan speeds from within the uh, BIOS. Or you can just do it through the uh, uh, driver, through the uh, operating systems API which is a lot easier. Uh, for example, you, in Windows, you can use the WMI, Windows System Management Interface. So countermeasures, uh, like before, zone separation, antivirus uh, monitoring, uh, you can try and regulate fan speeds, noise detection, try and detect these attacks. Uh, you can replace the fans with a cooling system, uh, all, such as water cooling, and you can try and uh, put in uh, insulation to try and uh, mitigate the noise. Okay, I'll just uh, jump ahead here. Okay, so uh, this phone is right next to another computer, another workstation. The workstation is fluctuating the uh, sound from the, via the, the fan speeds. 
and it's picking up these uh, uh, hexadecimal values, and this even works while there's music playing in the same room. Okay, the last kind of acoustic channel we'll talk about is disk filtration, and also another new method we came up in our labs. So hard drives also make noise, and the idea here is that if we can change the noise that the hard drive is emitting, then we can, uh, in fact, transmit signals from the computer and be picked up by microphones nearby. So you have the malware on the computer, like, like usual, affecting how the hard drive is uh, reading information, and that's emitting noise, which is picked up by either a smartwatch or a smartphone nearby. Now, how can you make a hard drive make noise? There are two different acoustic sources. You have the motor, which spins the plates, and you have the actuator, which is the head, which moves from track to track to pick up information. So if you look at the uh, acoustic spectrograms here, we see that uh, read and write and seek each make a different kinds of noise across the frequencies. And we found that actually the seek operation made the best signal. And uh, what we did is basically in order to send binary ones and zeros, we had the head move from one track to another track repeatedly, back and forth, back and forth. If we want to send a zero, we just have it sleep. And if you do that, actually even with neighboring tracks, then what happens is that the signal uh, comes through very well and you don't need to jump from one side of the hard disk to another. So some countermeasures, uh, you can replace your hard drives with uh, SSDs, you can get quieter hard drives, you install special enclosures, signal jammers, and zone separation. So here's the computer terminal. It's uh, affecting the hard drive uh, uh, actuator. And that information is being then interpreted by the uh, smartphone nearby. Now, if you think of it, you know, this, this case may happen quite frequently. Somebody at home in a bring your own device scenario has uh, downloaded a game from the internet, infects his phone, and he brings it to work. Puts his he gets to work, puts his phone right next to his computer, and he has no idea that it's picking up information from computers nearby. Okay, so let's talk about optical channels now. So the first optical channel is uh, Tempest. Now in a paper entitled Information Leakage from Optical Emanations, e emanations uh, the authors there showed that the blinking indicator light on hardware actually can divulge quite a bit of information about what's going through that device. So for example, think of a modem. When the modem's receiving information, the light might flicker for every packet or even bit that goes by. And if you have a sensitive enough recording device, you can actually interpret that information going through. So we thought, okay, what if we can actively affect those LEDs to exfiltrate the information we want to send? So we took one uh, example scenario. You have on almost every uh, uh, LCD screen a little LED indicating power and some of these can actually be uh, affected from the driver. So the malware on the computer will turn on or off the LED accordingly, and a camera nearby can pick up that uh, fluctuations in the light, even perhaps from outside the, the building via the window. So uh, what we did in order to show that it's plausible, we used an open source uh, library called Open uh, Computer Vision for image tracking. We found where the LED is on the screen we then extracted the blinking light to interpret binary. And we extracted a binary stream from there. Some countermeasures for Tempest. You can use uh, zoning policies, uh, malware signatures as usual, but the easiest solution is just putting a piece of tape over those uh, LEDs. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the next method, which is ScanGate. So ScanGate uh, was uh, proposed by Adi Shamir and uh, with, uh, was uh, in collaboration with our labs as well and presented in Black Hat a few years ago. And the idea is you have office scanners 
which uh, can light up the room when they scan, if the lights are off or at night. And they can also receive information if the room is light enough or dark enough. So we were wondering, how can you exploit that? So one uh, idea we had was you have a malware in the isolated network, and if it wants to send information to the attacker, so it will have the scanner turn on and light up the room a little bit. You have a sensitive camera on a drone, a drone outside the building looking at that window, and the light in the, in the room can be picked up and interprets that as binary, sends it over to the attacker, and vice versa. If the attacker wants to send information to the uh, malware, he shines a laser in the room, lights it up ever so slightly, a scanner is scanning, and can pick up that light as well. Okay, and the final optical channel is VisiSploit. Okay, so we also had an idea, instead of sending typical channels, what if we can hide sensitive information as pictures within the screen? Okay, so you have a typical, typical computer monitor, and you look at that computer monitor as a human, we see whatever image the screen provides us, but if we hide some sort of information, such as a picture or text in that image, it becomes very difficult for a human to see it, but very easy for a video camera to receive that and process that information in post. So we looked at two different approaches. One is uh, typically computer, the eye, first of all, eye sees about 72 frames per second. And the computer monitor, uh, typical LCD or LED monitor will refresh at about 60 hertz. And the idea is if every 60th frame we'll put in a, a sensitive image, such as blueprints or a QR code, the human won't see it, but the camera will pick it up. And another idea is that uh, Human, the human eye, it's very difficult for it to pick up the difference between two very close shades. So two very light shades or two very dark shades. But using uh, all sorts of uh, post-processing techniques, we can extract that information as well. So we took these two ideas and put them together. And the attack scenarios are where you have some sort of computer terminal, maybe even an ATM machine, and the attacker comes with a, a camera of some sort and records that screen just for a moment and then extracts the picture that's hidden in the image. To do this, you actually need uh, to add the malware to have uh, what we refer to as an image concealment module, somewhere between the application and the uh, graphics display driver and interface. So for our experimental results, we tried putting a picture of uh, blueprints on the screen, uh, different text, and QR code. The QR code we use because it's uh, very robust to uh, uh, errors. And uh, we used a whole bunch of different kinds of devices, uh, high quality cameras, simple cameras, webcams, smartphones. And we had 40 volunteers sit in front of a computer and take a look at this screen and tell us if they see anything strange. And we tried to adjust all, how quickly we'll flicker the image and things like that to find out where, what's that threshold that the human eye can't see it, yet we get the best throughput. So this is what it kind of looks like. I'm not sure if you can see on the screen so well. There's a, a QR code hidden in the back of this uh, terminal. Uh, after post-processing, it looks uh, all white like this, but you can pick up the uh, QR code quite nicely. Countermeasures for VisiSploit. So you, ha you can do zoning policies. You can take a look at uh, malware signatures and uh, all the typical methods that we talked about previously. Okay, so that brings us to the final type of channel, which is uh, radio channels. And uh, I like saving the best for last because radio channels are really the most efficient way of getting information out, uh, typically also very quickly, and not only that, but covertly. So let's talk about the first method, which is air hopper. So, in many cases, workplaces, that we mentioned before, have a policy of bring your own device. Sorry. Okay. And uh, with the bring your own device policy, that basically means that uh, people bring their own device from, uh, uh, from home to where they work, and the work doesn't supply their own phones. And we know that smartphones can receive radio signals of all different kinds. So the question was, how can we get computers to emit radio signals, and not just by plugging in a special antenna, how do we get it to emit radio signals without adding any hardware, purely software-based? Okay, so it looks something like this. You have a computer infected with malware emitting radio signals to a nearby device, 
And what's very convenient is that every single smartphone, nearly every smartphone, has an FM chip inside that can interpret and receive FM signals. So all we need to do is be able to affect the FM band, and by affecting the energy on the FM band, we can covertly send information to nearby smartphones. So that's a big question. How do you get computers to transmit radio signals on the FM band? So just a quick aside, how do antennas work? So in order to emit electromagnetic radiation or radio waves, uh, you basically have to oscillate current between two terminals, okay? And radio waves are characterized by two properties, the frequency, how quickly they're oscillating, and their amplitude, how large the oscillations are, okay? So one way to emit uh, EMR from a screen is to send very specific signals to be displayed on the screen. And what happens is the cable connecting to the screen actually emits uh, radio waves based off those signals. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of how to generate those signals. If you're interested in looking at that, you can take a look at our paper. Uh, but the general idea is that uh, certain frequencies and shapes affect the signals that are being emitted from these cables, whether it be VGA or DVI and so on. So we took that idea and we tried different modulations that affect the FM band. And in this case, we uh, basically want, since uh, FM is for uh, audio-based signals, so we generate tones. So perhaps a very low tone will be interpreted as 000, a higher tone as 100, and so on. The, uh, on the computer, you would have uh, some sort of text or information you want to send out to a nearby phone. You convert that to uh, tones based on this encoding, and then you transmit it via FM signals using the, uh, the idea that we discussed in the previous slide. And that's then received in the opposite direction on the uh, device. Or the device listens on FM, FM bands accordingly, demodulates information, and interprets the binary. So with the experimental results, we got about a, a distance of between 8 to 20 meters, uh, sending a bit rate of about uh, 10 bytes uh, per second. Uh, some countermeasures for Airhopper, you can have stricter zoning policies. You can uh, provide some sort of insulation, perhaps a Faraday cage if you're really uh, uh, paranoid. Uh, you can do jamming if, if you send out uh, even a light uh, F, uh, noise, white noise on the FM bands nearby, then you're going to block out the signal. And again, you can try and look for these kinds of signatures and malwares that are trying to uh, do these graphics manipulations. Okay, so here we have a, a compromised phone and an air-gapped computer. The computer is not connected to any Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no Ethernet, completely isolated. Okay, the phone is also not connected to the internet or anything like that. Okay, on the computer, the malware has some sort of keylogger that's listening to keystrokes and transmitting those keystrokes uh, over FM uh, signals through the display cable. So the user types top secret, and it's almost instantaneously received on the phone. Now, as we mentioned, the distance is about from between 8 to 20 meters, which means that even if you have a phone in the neighboring room, you can pick up these signals as well. So that's what this is coming to show. Somebody in a nearby room also picked up the, the message top secret. Okay, so the next paper, GSMEM, was presented at Usenix 2015. And uh, going along with the same lines that uh, bring your own device policy, well, typically um, in uh, many organizations there's restricted zones, uh, for example, uh, Intel and other organizations. And in these restricted zones, uh, guests or visitors are allowed to enter these zones, but they're not allowed to bring with them smartphones. They're allowed to bring with them feature phones. Feature phones are basically phones that don't have any special capabilities, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi. They're like the old kind of Nokia phones. And uh, what we wanted to show is that actually you can transmit information on GSM uh, frequencies, so that's uh, 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 2G frequencies, 
And that can be picked up by even a feature phone. And we'll see later also that you can pick it up by any, of course, any other software-defined radio device uh, and even pick it up in a better quality. But the question is, how do you get a computer to turn into a cellular base station? With, again, without any additional hardware. So what we found is that the CPU to memory bus, the, in other words, the channels going between the CPU and the memory registers, actually act as a very good antenna. So the idea is that we have the computer send information between the, the CPU and the memory, and that emits uh, radio waves, and that can be picked up by either uh, a simple phone or a more intelligent phone, or even uh, a very highly tailored uh, uh, radio device. So how does it work? So let's talk about emitting a signal. We had two general observations. One, if you make a very large transfer between the CPU and the memory, that emits radiation, but that only works if it's an uh, uninterrupted transmission, okay? That means that you have to bypass the cache in the CPU. So to do that, you use special instructions uh, that are available in Intel and AMD uh, architectures, and you send uh, a large amount of data to the memory, and that builds up uh, uh, um, uh, energy on the bus, and then that emits radiation as a result. We also found out that since the typical motherboards have a clock about 800 megahertz, so what happens is that the ener energy that's being emitted falls out mostly on the 800 megahertz range, which happens to be the GSM range. But it's not just that. We also see that it affects uh, LTE and UMTS technologies as well, uh, 4G and so on. So how does this work? So in order to send a bit, uh, we'll basically do nothing for X amount of time. And then uh, in order to send uh, fast for a zero, to send a one, we'll have, uh, make a large transmission for a certain amount of time. And we keep repeating that to send all our binary. And of course, like uh, other methods, we can put it into a frame to make sure that we're actually receiving a, uh, a signal and also try and do all sorts of different communication techniques because when you're talking about radio signals, the further away you are and the closer you are, you can move and that can affect the uh, signal quality. Some uh, properties about the transmitter. Uh, the transmitter itself only has a, a four kilobyte uh, memory footprint. It doesn't require any admin or root privileges to operate, and it doesn't use any APIs. And it affects Intel AMD architectures and works on both Windows and Linux. So in order to receive the signal, uh, what we did is, well, first of all, if you want to receive it on a phone, you have to affect the software or the firmware, really, that's written on the baseband chip, okay? So typically, baseband firmwares are closed source and very difficult to manipulate, uh, which is not going to deter uh, advanced persistent threats as, we, as we've seen in the past. But for the sake of our testing, what we did is we actually used an open source phone that allows you to actually change the baseband on a, a Motorola uh, C123 uh, with the open source uh, baseband software Osmocom BB. And in order to show the quality of the, uh, I should say, the uh, possibilities, we, we took a look at the uh, software-defined radio device, uh, USRP B210. Okay, so to receive uh, uh, these GSM uh, transmissions, all you gotta do is just listen on the best frequency, i.e. the frequency that fluctuates the least. And we look for the preamble. If we see a preamble, then we say, okay, this is probably a frame and then we extract the payload. So in our experimental results with the old Motorola phone, we got about a, a distance of about 170 centimeters. And with the uh, software-defined radio device, we got up to a, a distance of about 40 meters. And uh, we had two general observations. One is that uh, more channels to the memory, DDR3, DDR4, and so on and so forth, uh, increase the distance, increase the power to the signal and orientation uh, uh, affects the results. So if uh, the phone is on this side of the computer or that side of the computer, it will affect the quality of the signal. In terms of data rates, with the old Motorola phone, we got about uh, approximately one uh, bit per second. Uh, but with uh, the software-defined radio device, we got about 1,000 bits per second. So countermeasures for GSMM, you can use uh, uh, interference, uh, shielding, again, zoning policies, don't allow any phones whatsoever into restricted areas, and look for particular signatures. Okay. 
OK, so uh, here we have uh, AirGap computer. And in the middle, there's a Motorola uh, C123 phone. And on the uh, AirGap computer, there's a keylogger. And the keylogger, sorry, let me skip to the right spot. And the keylogger is listening, picks up the password that's being typed in, and it transmits it through the memory bus to the neighboring phone. OK, so the final method we're going to talk about today is a very new method called USB, uh, again by uh, Mordechai Guri. Uh, within the leaked documents from the Snowden uh, incident, uh, we found that uh, NSA was using uh, uh, methods of hiding transmitters within USB devices. But that requires adding some additional hardware to the USB devices, although they are concealed. And the idea is we're thinking that how do we get USB devices to emit radio signals without any additional hardware? How can we have your USB key, when plugged in, emit radio signals? And very briefly, without going into it uh, because of time, uh, the encoding that goes over the wires for USB uh, uh, write operations is in uh, NRZI. And uh, using that idea, what we do is uh, we, have, we send a whole sequence of zeros when we want to send a one that causes the signal to fluctuate. And we send a whole sequence of ones when we want to send a, a one that causes the signal to be solid. In other words, not sending any information. And you can play around with that to send different t uh, tones, if you will, over, uh, uh, over the air to make uh, different uh, FSK modulations. And uh, it's important to note that the malware on the host doesn't require any special permissions to write to the USB. So it can just operate as is uh, without any uh, problems. Oh, sorry, and one more thing. Uh, we also noticed that because the USB, or at least USB 2.0 clock speed, uh, has a very particular uh, speed, so we, the transmission falls out between 240 megahertz and 480 megahertz. So if you're listening on those spectrums, that's where you're going to find the emissions. So from experimental results, we got about a distance of two to three meters at a data rate of about 80 bytes per second. And all the typical uh, countermeasures can be employed. Uh, you can put a Faraday cage if you really want to, uh, distancing policies, and malware detection. So our last uh, demonstration here. Okay, so you have our, again, our typical air gap uh, computer. On top you see there is a USB hard drive plugged in, and we're going to send write commands to the hard drive, affecting the, uh, the signal that's being emitted from the cable. So right now the, the device is about to transmit, and in a neighboring room we have a computer with its own little antenna. Okay, and uh, as once at the bottom there's a spectrogram there so you can see how the energy is affected on their all frequencies. And the moment it starts sending a one, zero, one, zero, you'll start seeing it in the spectrograms down below. So as you can see, it's very easy to pick up uh, these signals. Okay, so. Let's uh, make some concluding remarks. So who should be worried about all these uh, different kinds of creative attacks? As a, a rule of thumb, uh, there are three different points you might want to consider. If your air gap network is a plausible target for advanced persistent threat, if uh, your network is very limited with regards to insider activity, in other words, uh, the attacker may be really coerced to try and find these creative ways of getting uh, information out uh, because he may not have a, a perhaps a, a spy or what have you inside the network to just plug in or exfiltrate the data himself. And uh, if you have uh, strict zoning policies, you may want to consider even stricter ones. In terms of what are the most plausible attacks, we mentioned this already, those pretty much the radio-based uh, attacks, uh, such as DSMM, Airhopper, and USB. Uh, Symantec put out a report based off, uh, uh, for example, our paper on Airhopper, pointing out that this is a, a very dangerous type of attack because it's so covert and uh, rather simple to implement. 
And uh, in conclusion, uh, how can we summarize? So there's four different channels reviewed today. Uh, the assumption, again, I have to re reiterate this, that your, the first step is that the attacker infected the network, the isolated network, with some sort of malware. In some way, the attacker came. Uh, sorry, the, he had some insider come and plant a USB device, infected the machines. And after that point, we were wondering how can the attacker send information to that malware and get information out from that malware. The takeaways are uh, air gapping a network is not uh, a guaranteed solution. It does not provide a perfect disconnect. But not everybody is a target. And if you are a target or you may think you are a target, perhaps uh, extra precautions, zoning policies should be taken into, into consideration. And that's all. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting presentation oh, and uh, very impressive. And um, uh, my question is, um, uh, what kind of a signature is effective for such attack? You mentioned the signature for uh, multiple uh, channels and multiple times, but uh, I'm not, I don't think it's uh, realistic uh, to uh, take care to uh, build the signature uh, one by one, I mean the one uh, malware by one signature. Mm -hmm. So um, I, wanna, uh, I, wanna want, uh, I want you to uh, share your idea about mm -hmm. the signature. Well, it really depends on the type of channel we're talking about. So if it's uh, a thermal channel, you may want to consider uh, any logic that's reading thermal sensors and trying to interpret it in some sort of way, uh, such as the modulation. So modulation always has some sort of interval where wait one second, read, wait one second, read, and interpret that as a one or zero, one and zero continuously. So that kind of uh, loop and in, in regards to some sensor. And again, also with uh, emitting some sort of uh, radiation, there's always going to be some sort of cycle where the transmission is occurring. And it's always going to affect some sort of sensor or some sort of property where you can look for the function calls there. So, uh, yeah. so you mentioned about the behavior basis signature uh, could be effective for their, mm -hmm. uh, such kind of attack. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. the same uh, Yeah, uh, for dynamic analysis. In terms of uh, static, um, some of these are going to be kind of tricky to detect. Uh, you really just kind of have to uh, look for the different kinds of function calls that are related. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah.